first of all, I guess, uh, thanks everybody for, for attending today's workshop. Um, I'm guessing everybody's looking out windows at similar days as I am and starting to get nervous about um, your volunteer groups getting together and, and how you're gonna pull off counting, you know, almost a million fish or maybe more than that. Um, so this is that time of year and it's great. Uh, we have a couple special guests, John Shepard from Massachusetts Department of Fish and Wildlife and Mike Brown from Maine DMR have um, um, graciously agreed to be here today. Um, John's gonna go through a, a present presentation just talking about um, the logistics and and um, different things that go into counting these fish um, as they come past us. And then he and Michael both stick around. I think he's gonna go a little bit into um, the video count software or database or um, spreadsheet system to be able to kind of keep track of, of what you're counting in a way that's really defensible and, and usable for, for different uses. So um, we'll stick around at the end of the presentation for uh, some Q and A, which should actually be really great too. And then we'll make all this um, and probably some synthesis of the notes um, available on our website as part of our tools for, for this monitoring and stewardship of river herring. So um, with that, um, John, Mike and John, are you guys both ready to get started? Uh, yep, all set. All right, uh, great. Uh, John, if you wanna go ahead and start to share your screen, I'll shut up and let you get through it and we'll all kind of handle facilitating the Q&A. If folks have questions um, during the, the talk, they can feel free to put those in the in the chat and I'll try to, to go through those as we get along or else you can wait and raise your hand after. So thanks, John, go ahead. Okay, uh, can everybody see this? Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, just fine, John, okay. thanks. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Shepard. I'm with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, I'm a uh, I'm an area diagramus fisheries biologist, and I cover I run I oversee a series of monitoring programs for diagramus fish, primarily in uh, southeastern Massachusetts. So I cover an area uh, south of Boston Harbor. So it's the, the South Shore, the Cape and Islands and west towards the Rhode Island line. Um, I oversee monitoring projects primarily for river herring, but I also um, I also do uh, American shad monitoring. And to a lesser extent, I also help out with monitoring for American eels, uh, rainbow smelt, and opportunistically some of our other uh, diagnosis fish that, uh, that we opportunistically come across with uh, in, our, in our monitoring programs. So, Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, talk to you about uh, a review of our river herring uh, visual counting programs here in Massachusetts. And so in this presentation, I'll give you a, a brief overview of herring counting in Massachusetts. I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the principles and general concepts for conducting visual counts, as well as um, once you have those counts, um, how to treat them statistically. Uh, to produce estimates of daily passage as well as daily uh, run size or total run size. And with that, I'll, I'll get into the uh, the software program that we use, uh, Visual Count, um, talking about the data entry, but also um, the QA, QC process um, for uh, for that data. I'll come, I'll come up with, I'll talk about some general recommendations that we've made and then I'll also talk about the review that we recently conducted with all of our visual counts. I'll discuss uh, a few different case studies, and then I'll talk about some of the limitations that are associated with visual counts, and then just summarize at the end. So um, river herring monitoring and counting here in Massachusetts, it goes back as far as 1980. And so the map here on the left, um, this is a, a, a map showing the uh, locations as well as general summary statistics for river herring counting that we did uh, last year in 2023. And so in 2023, we had 48 locations that were counted using a variety of methods, but visual counting, which are the, the marker, the green markers shown on the map, that's the most common method that we use. It comprises over 60% of all the locations that we monitor. And so with that, 
citizen scientists, you know, they make significant contributions uh, to monitoring and counting. So in 2023, 90% of the streams were either monitored solely by volunteers or with the assistance of volunteers. And so the volunteers, they come from, uh, you know, from all different backgrounds and various organizations from just, you know, private individuals, uh, municipal commissions, watershed shed associations, non-government and private organizations. So from 2000 to 2006, we saw significant declines in many of our river herring populations here in Massachusetts. And this ultimately, ultimately led to the prohibition of harvest and possession in 2006. And during this period, we had a growing interest from the public in the status of river herring populations here in Massachusetts. And so as far back as this time, we did have community groups that had established visual counting programs. Uh, however, many of them didn't use proper statistical techniques that were required to produce reliable estimates of herring run size. And so due to uh, you know the uh, public demand, um, our agency, uh, we hosted a river herring counting workshop in 2005. And at this workshop, we had various groups come to us and they presented data and information about their individual runs. And so by synthesizing all this data, we wound up publishing a technical report to estimate run sizes using visual counts. And that uh, report is available on our website. Uh, the web link is shown here. It's under our technical series. It's technical report number 25. And so... The objective uh, for this was we wanted to, to guide community watersheds that were currently conducting visual counts or that wanted to start visual counts. We wanted to provide recommended sampling designs and protocols and give them the tools to produce statistically sound estimates of run size. And then with the hope that in the future, we could review this data and consider you know, some of these data sets for future state and or federal stock assessments. So as we know, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, they've established certain biological criteria to identify river systems to represent in their regional and coastwide status of river herring populations. And so one of the, um, one of the uh, criteria that's required is they want a minimum of 10 year time series of abundance estimates. Um, and then where possible um, to augment those abundance estimates with biological data. Um, you know, primarily from biological sampling. So uh, here in Massachusetts, we have five rivers that are represented in the most recent AFSMFC river herring stock assessment. Uh, one of which um, is monitored using visual counts and the other is monitored using a combination of both visual and video counting. So next, I just wanted to talk about, you know, the basic principles for conducting visual counts. And so, the initial concept for estimating river herring populations using visual counts was conducted by a gentleman named Rideout as part of his graduate research. And this was done back in the 1970s. And this was done on the Parker River here in Massachusetts. And the Parker is being one of those five rivers that's representing Massachusetts in, you know, the coastwide stock assessment. So what I have here is I just, I have a, a basic diagram um, that summarizes the basic concept of ride out sampling design. So if you if you look at the x axis below, this is the uh, this is the day of the year, um, and then you have two y axis here. So one of them is um, is time, which is basically your daily observation period. And so in this example, you have um, a daily a twelve hour daily observation period. You just say from seven a.m. to seven p.m. and then the other y-axis is n, which is basically the number of fish. And so the curve that you see here on the graph, this represents, say, your theoretical run. Um, and so under Rideout's design, you know, visual counts would be conducted randomly each day throughout the, the spawning season. And so that's kind of represented by these shaded blocks that you see um, on the graph here now. And so basically the blocks, let's say these represent uh, counts that were conducted in 10 minute observation periods. So 
Uh, the ones that fall uh, within the curve, let's say those were accounts where fish were actually observed passing. And then the ones that are conducted outside the curve would be ones where, say, no fish were observed at the time. <clears throat> and so from this, you could calculate a mean um, daily passage rate. And this is estimated from the visual counts that were conducted each day. And then you would extrapolate that over the daily observation period to provide estimates of daily passage. So I just kind of highlighted one example here. Say on day X, you did four counts. Uh, three of them, you know, that fall within that curve, there are counts where you observed fish and then you have one observation that didn't. And so you would basically, you know, you would take the sum of those counts, you would divide that by the number of observations and that gives you the number of fish per 10 minutes. If these counts were done in 10 minute periods, that's to be the number of fish that were, that's the average number of fish over 10 minutes. And then you would then multiply that, say, by hour. That gives you the number of fish per hour. And then if you have a 12-hour observation period for that day, you, you would have the number of fish per 12 hours. And then the cumulative sum of, of that, which is basically your estimate of daily passage, the cumulative sum would then be your estimate of run size. And so... You know, some counting groups, they try to adhere to write out sampling scheme, but what we found is that the required daily coverage and the hourly sampling is oftentimes not achieved. And this can be due to a variety of reasons. If you don't have enough volunteers, if you have, you know, scheduling difficulties and things like that. Um, so for these reasons, uh, my colleague, uh, Gary Nelson, um, he's one of our chief um stock assessment biologists and fishery sta and um, statisticians. And he's the one who actually, um, you know, designed uh, this, uh, this program and developed uh, this, you know, this technical report. In this report, he conducted a review of basic statistical concepts to develop alternative sampling designs for use by volunteer groups to estimate river herring populations using visual counts. <clears throat> and so, this technical report, it provides guidelines to define sampling periods and the number of counts to be conducted within each period. So what I have here is I have three examples of three different um, sampling schemes. And so the one to the left here, this is what we call a one-way stratified random sampling design. And so basically what you have here is each day is divided up into a 12-hour observation period. So for example, you have 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And within under this design, you want to conduct a minimum of two random counts per day. Um, if you go to the example here in the middle, this is what we call a two-way, two-period uh, sampling design. And so this one, you know, you've got your 12-hour daily observation period, but what you're doing is you're dividing it up into two six-hour sub-periods. And, and under this um, and under this uh, design here, you would conduct a minimum of two counts randomly within these two six hour sub periods. So basically you've got two different sampling strata. And then the example on the right here, it's the same thing again, except instead of two six hour periods, you have three four hour periods. And under this design, you're conducting a minimum of three randomized counts within three, um, within these uh, three, four hour sub periods. And so what we find is that this example, this two way, three period sampling design, it produces you know, estimates that have the have to have um, a higher level of accuracy and a lower level of, of percent standard error to them. And it's largely because basically in general, what you see is the more counting periods and the more counts that you conduct randomly within each period, um, it's, it produces a higher level of accuracy. You know, the less amount of, of time where you have uh, no observations, it's, it's less extrapolation and estimation that the program has to, has to conduct. And so therefore it lowers your probability of error. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into the, uh, the visual count, the visual count program here. Um, so, um, so along with these sampling designs and protocols outlined in the technical report, 
Um, Gary developed a, a visual basic program to estimate both the daily passage as well as total run size using visual count sampling data. And so what I have here is I just have some screenshots. This is actually um, the older version of the program, but you know the newer version is still more or less the same. You know, this is just the uh, the screenshot on the left is just the general uh, a basic menu. Um, the one on the upper right, this is basically the, um, where you enter in your input data. And so to generate these estimates, you know, we require four, uh, four input variables. Uh, what you need is the date. You need the start, the time you started your count, the time you ended your count, and then the, the number of fish that you counted. So that's really what's required um, to generate these estimates. But the program can also generate summary statistics on environmental data. So for example, you know, you can collect things like air temperature, you can collect water temperature, you can collect information on weather conditions, and you can even add in general comments. Um, you know, but you know, that data is optional. It's not actually required um, to run the program. And so the screen, uh, the the screenshot on the bottom here, this just is an example of some of the output data that you can get. So you can generate estimates of daily passage. Um, you can get it in both table format. You can export it as an Excel file. It also portrays it graphically. Um, it gives you the estimate of the total run size. And then down below it also, um, what they have uh, has a built-in power analysis, which I'm gonna get into uh, momentarily. <clears throat> so one of the uh one of the really neat features of the program is that it has a quality assurance quality control feature to it so it can check and identify errors in the data and it allows the user to edit and correct individual entries before conducting the analysis to produce the uh, these estimates um also the program can also test the statistical ability of these estimates to detect population trends using what we call a power analysis. And so uh, statistically, you know, the definition of power is the ability to detect changes when they're occurring. So in this case, the power analysis examines the probability of detecting change uh, over time given the level of sampling intensity. And so the, um, the power is affected by various uh, factors, including the natural variability in fish passing. Um, the big one being, you know, the sample size taken to estimate, um, as well as the significance level and the, the size of the change that you want to detect. And so if you look at the graph on the left here, what you see here is on the x-axis, you have the percent change over time. And then the y-axis is the probability of detecting change or power in this case. And so you see different V-shaped curves here. And so ideally what you would want to see is you want to see a sharp uh, V-shaped curve. Um, the, the steeper or the sharper the curve, the higher the probability of being able to detect uh, change. And so here what I have is um, these, these figures are theoretical examples to, to demonstrate the effect of sample size and sampling frequency on the accuracy of run size estimates. So what we have is um, this is um, basically, you know, if you have a, a theoretically known run size. And so what we do is we conducted um, simulation exercises taken from a run where, say, between 1 and 13 10 minute count intervals were randomly selected each day. And so the simulation was repeated 500 times for each sample size to generate a distribution of total run size values that could be obtained if sampling was repeated. And so the graphs here, they show the results of each simulation represented by a mean with 95 percentiles. And so if you look at the top graph, this is figure A. This shows the, the effect of sample size on precision. And so you'll notice that as the sample size increases, the percent standard error, you know, uh, gets gets smaller, which, you know, which is something that in theory you would expect to see. Now, if you look at figure B right below it, this is an example of what we call patterned or aggregate sampling. And so this shows the effect of this type of sampling on precision. So in this example here, 
let's say you you have a river where you only go to count in the afternoon. Um, you're not doing any counting in the morning. Um, and so the results here indicate that, you know, pattern sampling will produce bias estimates of the total run size, even though precision of the estimates are increasing with increasing sample size, the accuracy doesn't. And it's largely because you're assuming that what, you know, the passage rates that you're seeing in the afternoon are also representative of, of what passage is in, is in the morning, which oftentimes what we see is, you know, in, you know, in the natural world, we don't, you know, herring don't run uniformly. So, um, and so the examples that you see on the right here, this is just shows the effect of, of if you have days where no counts are conducted um, and that effect on your, on the accuracy of your estimates. So basically what you have is the effects of one day missing, two days, sequential days missing, three sequential days missing, four and so on. And as you can see, it's just, you know, the more days that are missing, um, the higher the level of error, because again, the program has to extrapolate, you know, over a greater period of time. And so it increases the probability of error in your estimates. So what I wanted to kind of show you is I wanted to show you here just some um, some examples of, of, you know, some of these different um, biases um, in sampling and its and its effect on you know the accuracy of the estimates and in particular the power analysis. So the example here I, I have here on the top is let's say you have a small a small run. Um, oftentimes what we see with small runs is that you know passage oftentimes occurs over a narrow window of time where you see like one you know oftentimes you might see like a single spike in activity and then. For the rest of the duration of the run, you know, you have much, you have very low passage activity, maybe a couple bumps here and there, um, and so oftentimes um, this can, you know, because your the program is extrapolating over the course of the entire run, it can have an effect on the accuracy of the estimates, and you see that with the power analysis uh, to the right of the figure here, you know, the the ability to detect change is is low. The second example, the one in here in the middle, this is uh, admittedly, this is probably the most common case that we see with a lot of our visual count data is that um, a lot of times we just, we don't have, it's a low sample size. Um, what the the graph here is showing, these are the number of counts by day. So the total number of, of counts for each individual day. And a lot of these, you know, there's, you know, maybe only two counts a day, many of these only one count a day. And then you have you know, several days where there's missing counts. And because of those, because of the low sample size and the significant gaps in time where there's no counting, that has, you know, a significant effect on your, on the accuracy and the precision of your data. And that's reflected in the power analysis to the right. Now, the one on the bottom here, this is an example of aggregate or pattern sampling. So what you have here is, this is a particular run where, um, you know, the, the volunteers, they know that there's a significant amount of activity where fish are passing um, at dusk. And so they purposely concentrate a lot of their counting during that particular time because they know that's when the fish are there. Um, and then so there's a heavy concentration within, say, a three hour window here. And then throughout the rest of the run or throughout the rest of the day, you know, the, the number of counts are very sparse. And again, that's, you know, it's, um it affects the accuracy of your estimates because it's, you know, again, the computer is, 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 it's heavily weighting that, um that period of time in which, you know, you see all this activity and it's extrapolating it over the course of the day. So, um, so based on that initial workshop that we had back in 2005 and based on, you know, synthesizing all the information that all the different groups gave us uh, pertaining to their particular uh, particular runs, we developed uh, the following recommendations. We recommended that programs follow a two-way stratified random sampling design in which volunteers would make a minimum of three 10-minute counts during each of three daily observation periods. So, for example, 
you know, a minimum of three counts between 7 a.m. and 11 a.m., a minimum of three counts between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m., and a minimum of three between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m., and that the counts would be conducted throughout the entire spring spawning run. So if the run began in April, you want to be, you know, you want to be counting and you would count until the end. <clears throat> so in 2022, um, we conducted an internal review of all of our visual count data from all our different sites and for all years in which counting occurred. We did this review uh, to determine the reliability of estimates, as well as to identify any data sets that could potentially be included into future assessments. And so in this review, we identified you know, errors and inconsistency in count metrics. And in doing so, we wanted to standardize these metrics to make them consistent over the course of time. So particularly looking at things like you know, the start date, the end date, uh, making sure that the daily observation period for each day is consistent, as well as the counting interval, and making sure that they follow you know, a consistent sampling design throughout. And so once we standardize all these metrics, we would then re-estimate um, you know, the daily and total run sizes for each year. And, and what we found is that in, in some years where if we, we saw significant departures from these standardized metrics, we would have to remove those years. So, you know, as, as I said, you know, for each run, we generated summary statistics for all years where monitoring occurred. And so that's kind of shown in this, this is an example summary table that I have here below. And this, in this example, this is the Herring River and Wolfleet. This is, um, this was, con visual counts were conducted between uh, the years 2012 through 2023. And so we examined several parameters for standardization, including the first and last days of counting, the number of days of uh, missing counts, uh, we looked at the number of days where there were insufficient numbers of counts and then the start and end times of the daily observation periods. And so we developed newly standardized metrics by finding a consistent range for, e for each sampling strata. So namely looking at, you know, the daily observation period, which is here on the left, and that's in the, the, the consistent or the standardized metric is the area that's shaded in yellow and the number of days counted, which is here on the right. And again, you know, for standardization, we, you know, we uh, we outlined this area in yellow. And so any counts that were conducted outside of these standardized um, observation periods, you know, we omitted those from the analysis. So once we standardized these metrics, we then re-estimated the daily daily passage rates as well as the total run size for all locations and for all years monitored. So Again, using the Herring River Wall Fleet as an example, um, you know, we basically came up with the um, standardized metrics for the daily uh, for the daily uh, monitoring period. So, this one here was basically between April first and May twenty fifth. Um, the daily observation period be between seven a.m. and seven p.m. And then we then reestimated, you know, um, both daily and total run size uh, for each. So next, I just want to, I just got, I have like three examples, um, three uh, case studies here. Um, these are examples of runs that were reviewed, that were reviewed and were shown to have good quality data. So for each one of these, I'm going to show you the run size estimates, which is the graph on the top, um, as well as the number of counts uh, conducted for each hour of each day throughout the monitoring period. And that's the middle graph here and then the power analysis down below. Um, so here, this first one here, this is the Mystic River. This is in the Boston Harbor watershed. This is a 10-year time series. Um, we have one year of missing data, 2020. That was the, uh, you know, the pandemic year. Um, and basically what they did, you know, this group, uh, this is the Mystic River Watershed Association. They they really do a great job. You know, they've got a large volunteer um, pool and, you know, they've been in, they, they've really done a great job of, you know, going out there and, you know, and consistently counting, um, you know, basically, you know, an average of nine counts per day. If you look at the number of counts per hour here in this middle graph, pretty much every hour of each day, 
is very well and, and pretty and fairly evenly represented throughout the course of the entire um, monitoring period. Um, their visual count is augmented by a video monitoring system that they brought online about four years ago. Um, and so with this, the, you know, because of the, uh, the good quality of this data, this has potential for inclusion into future stock assessments. This next one, this is the Namaskat River. This is in uh, this is in Middleborough. This is part of our uh, this is part of the uh, Taunton River watershed. Um, this is uh, a 19 year time series. Um, and for this one, this is a volunteer count. And this one actually is included in the uh, state and coastwide stock assessment. Now you'll notice here they. In this one, they don't use a two-way, three-period uh, sampling design. This is actually a two-way, two-period sampling design. And you'll notice here, if you look at the, the number of counts per hour, um, what you see is you see most of the counts tend to be around lunchtime or just after lunch. It's just that over the 19-year period, this is a very, you know, this is a, a consistent pattern. They've pretty much been doing this the same way uh, throughout. And so, and it actually, you know, because they, it is, um, they do uh, heavily uh, sample this, you know, the, uh, the the ability to detect change over time is, is strong. And so, as I mentioned, this is one of the uh, river systems that is represented in the coastwide stock assessment. And so last one I have here, this is the Marsons Mill River. This is on the Cape. Um, again, this is a 11-year uh, time series. You know, again, 2020 is missing due to the pandemic. Um, this one, they use a two-way, three-period um, sampling uh, design. As you can see, pretty much all hours are, are fairly well and consistently represented here. The power analysis is good. And so this one, you know, is another, um, it's another river system where, you know, it could be a potential candidate for inclusion into future assessments. So... The last thing I wanted to talk about before I wrap this up is I just want to talk about some of the limitations of this data. Um, you know, because, you know, because we're um, we're conducting visual counts and for the most part, you know, you're doing it within a specified uh, daily observation period. It's not a 24 hour day observation period. Um, you know, these are not true population estimates. However, um, if they are conducted um, in a consistent manner and year after year, what you can do is you can produce indices of abundance that you can track over time and you can, you know, you can identify trends using this data. Um, and so, you know, um, with that, um, the, um, we actually had to, you know, there are some years where, you know, we had to um, omit counts, especially if they, if they deviated significantly from the standardized metrics. Um, these newly standardized metrics, they don't account for changes in phenology. And what is phenology? Phenology is the timing of certain life history events uh, within organisms. And so in this particular case, what you know, when we're out there in the spring and we're we're counting and we're monitoring these populations. We're, we're basically monitoring the spring spawning migration. And so the timing of this is a major phenological event for river herring. And so what I have here is I've, done, I've identified a couple studies here. These are studies that looked at um, the patterns of, of river herring migrations in several Massachusetts rivers over time. So looking at time series of, of, of passage uh, within these different river systems, what we are seeing is that we are seeing um, changes in their in their migratory behavior. In a lot of places, um, the um, the timing of these migrations is shifting, you know, and they're ha they're occurring earlier. And so, because you're using these standardized metrics, you know, it doesn't account for you know for these changes. So oftentimes, when when groups, you know, they ask me, you know. When should I go out and count? I mean, I typically recommend to them that you know they should they should start counting as soon as fish start showing up. Now that that data may or may not be used when we actually uh, go to run the estimates, 
but I think it's important to document these changes. Um, <clears throat> the standardized metrics, they don't account for changes in deal migration patterns uh, because you're using a set um, daily observation window. Let's say, for example, you're using 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. You know, you're not accounting for any activity that, that occurs outside of those hours. And so in some places, you know, we, we do know that there are runs that, you know, where you see a lot of passage activity that occurs outside of those hours, for example, say at dawn or at dusk. Um, and even so, um, you know, we are, we're seeing growing evidence, especially in, in a lot of our runs on Cape Cod, where some of these runs were traditionally, um, you know, they were daytime runs. You go out during the day, you'd see the fish passing, but over time, their behavior has changed. You know, some of these, you know, you're seeing more passage, you know, during um, during low light hours and some of them supposedly even at night. And we suspect that, you know, there could be various reasons for that. We suspect some of it being, you know, predator avoidance. Um, and so with these, you know, depending on uh, the metrics that you use, it may or may not account for, you know, for uh, changes in these patterns. And then just a couple of other, you know, these are just general limitations just with with visual counts. But one, it's it's difficult to maintain consistent count metrics over time. Um, we also find that, you know, it can be difficult to maintain volunteer involvement year after year, especially in a situation where if you have um, a small run and oftentimes, you know, volunteers are going out, but they're consistently not seeing anything. Um, that can be discouraging for people. And some people, you know, they say, well, why why am I bothering if I'm going out there and I'm never seeing anything? I always stress to groups that, that you know, even those observations where you're not seeing any fish, it's still really, really important data. You know, it gives us information about, you know, the patterns and the behavior of these fish. Um, it's still very important data. So I try to stress that to groups. <clears throat> So just to summarize, um, public interest in monitoring river herring populations in Massachusetts, it's been growing in recent years. The abundance estimates derive from visual counts that if you, if you have consistent metrics and you do it consistently over time, year after year, you can provide the level of accuracy to infer population trends. As of now, we have three Massachusetts streams that are monitored with the help of citizen groups that are contributing to state and coastwide river herring stock assessments. And we have several uh, streams that are being monitored by citizen groups that have the potential to be included in future assessments. And probably within the next year or so, we are planning to hold another workshop to review uh, these counting protocols and sampling methodologies as well. And so with that, you know, I just want, you know, we really want to thank, you know, various groups, various organizations and individuals who have been contributing to this effort, um, you know, over the course of many, many years, particularly volunteers. Um, and so um, this information here, it is available on our website. Once again, um, the link to the, uh, the technical report is shown here. Um, I also have a link to the visual count program. You know, it's it's a it's a free program. Pretty much anyone can use it. Um, and, you know, we'd certainly be available to help to show people how it works and whatnot. So any inquiries, uh, please let me know. And so with that, you know, thank thank you, everyone, for your time. Thanks so much, John. Um, that was super helpful. Very very good. Um, I maybe Mike um, Brown. Do you have any sort of uh, anything you want to add to that? That was uh, that was really good. I think it's it's really cool that we have this these um, similar networks going on in Massachusetts and Maine and some places where they all come together like um, like this. Um, maybe and obviously fish swimming and counting them isn't that transfer nicely across boundaries. So it's the same counting fish in one state as the other, but Mike, I don't know if you want to add anything on uh, some main specific um, comments or, or comments from DMR on on that or or things yeah, that are priority for you. Yeah, just a couple, Mike. John, thank you very much. The presentation was was terrific. Thank and you. One of the things that that's really really nice about this program is that it 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 gets everybody to do 
the accounting methodology in the same way. And it goes a step beyond that because oftentimes as as, as state representatives, we go, we talk about different kinds of accounting programs, what the visual account um, documentation lays out and John presented it is it's a way for um, groups who are doing counting, especially volunteer counting, to see in a visual form how changes in their counting um, strategy or planning really can affect the end product, which is fine just as long as they, they know if they don't have a lot of volunteers or they skip days or they go um, to, a, to a place to count um, like before they go to work at seven o'clock every day or during the lunch hour um, after they get off work, how that periodic sampling can, can really affect the, the data that they're collecting and the, the end product. So that, that's really, really important. We realize that there are certainly, you know, as John said, uh, limitations in volunteer groups and what they can do. And we certainly appreciate any sort of counts that, that they can do. But we do have a handful of folks in Maine who are already using the visual count program. Um, the, the one that follows it most closely are the folks at Orland. I set up a schedule for them where they do the the two-way um, three-sample segment design. Um, they do a good job. Their problem is they often have a hard time getting volunteers to, to, to go there on a regular basis, as is in most organizations. They have a handful of very, very dedicated volunteers, but there are times, unfortunately, when, when they can't fulfill the whole schedule. And that has an effect on this. But um, if what the visual count program does, it provides a way for, for the state of Maine folks who are doing the counts to have comparable results with the folks in Massachusetts and New Hampshire who are doing the, the same kind of work. So it allows us to um, compare some of the run counts and methodology that they're doing to the same things that we're doing here. And that's really, really helpful in the end. So um, that's one thing that we would, we would like um, to, to be able to do if we can. Um, as John said, um, there's a visual count program you can put on your computer. There's also a Shiny app that, that Gary has developed that's available too. It's not quite as robust as the, the desktop version because the desktop version does have the power analysis in it, which is really, really helpful. But we can provide those to folks. And um, one thing that's nice about the visual count program too is as you go along, you've, you've set your schedule you enter the data just like you would in Excel, except you do it into the program and the program will go ahead and do all your summary statistics for you. You don't have to go ahead and do those uh, separately. They're already included and, and we know that they're correct. And unfortunately, I know this from firsthand that there are a lot of error checks in there. So if you, if you sample outside your 10 minute bracket, if you sample outside your design sample day, it will show an error and you will not be able to go forward until you correct it, which is really, really good. And, and at least in my case, anyways, it uh, leaves absolutely no no room for, for making mistakes. So your data entry has to be, be good. But once it's done, it's done. And uh, you'll have some really good information that you can share, not only with the state, but also with the groups that, uh, that, that you belong to. And it's something that I hope that in the future we can put on the River Herring Network here in Maine so that it's a that's a good visualization tool. I know the folks that are doing the accounts down in the Quasit do something very similar. And it's a really neat addition to, to their website and and uh, showing the results from different years of the run. So um, I'd be glad to do what I can to help people, you know, initially as they go ahead and develop the schedules or fill out the forms to help with that and provide the programs in hopes that we can um, do this in a manner that that is sort of consistent along um, all three states and in, in New England. So thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, we can open up the questions. And I want to say, you know, any question county related, I think is fair game. You, you know, a lot of this was was around statistics and, and those, you know, the type of models we use to count fish. But even if you have questions on like, how do I see the fish in muddy water? You know, any anything that if folks are new um, coming into this, um, um, there's, no rules on questions, so uh, fire away. Like we can, folks can unmute and probably just ask questions, or else you can raise your hand. Um, we'll see what happens. We did have a couple questions from the chat. Um, I think both those were answered by Mike. It's just whether or not this is web based and open sourced, and and it is. And like Mike said, um, we'll make they'll make this available. He has it available. We'll post it on our uh, Riverdale um, 
network website in the tools section. I think uh, it's on the John showed a link to that that Massachusetts has. So, any questions? Hey there, Mike. Thank you, John, and, and thank you, um, Mike, as well. It's really great seeing this. And I I wonder about um, whether Mass has experience with some secondary monitoring with video or DNA. I've seen we saw a great demonstration of that work in the Chesapeake in our earlier River Network webinar, which gave me great hope. Maybe probably more than it deserves that. You know, we'll be able to supplement these these um, counts with with video and eDNA sampling. You know, con continuous monitoring eDNA. Um, do you have anything in Mass that you've used those other alternatives to help amplify the volunteer counts? Sure. Um, so I guess uh, first I'll start with the uh, with video. Um, <clears throat> So actually, one of the case studies that I showed, um, it was the the first one, uh, the the Mystic River. So that one, you know, it started out as a visual count, and they technically they still do the uh, the volunteer visual there. But I'd say I think it was four years ago they've also been um, using uh, a video system there, and um, and so one of my colleagues, uh, Ben Gahagan, he actually he actually did a talk because he was. Um, cause you know, that Boston Harbor is like, it's outside of my general area. Um, that was his area there. So he was working more closely with them, but he did some comparative analysis looking at, um, video estimates versus volunteer, um, visual counts and, you know, the extrapolated estimates from that, you know, and, and again, it's, um, you know, it, you know, it, you know, it is one of the in inherent biases in, in data, um, you know, because obviously, you know, with the visual counts, you're only conducting it, say, in their case, they're only doing a 12 hour observation period, whereas the video gives you the potential to do 24 hours. So any passage that is outside of that, you know, window of of the observations not being accounted for. So generally what we find is that, you know, in many cases, you know, or in some of these cases, you know, especially if you have larger run sizes, the estimates from from visual can oftentimes be um, uh, an underestimate of of population, especially if you have significant activity outside your daily observation window. There, um, the and for the second one, eDNA, um, you know, it is a field that I have uh, I have had some exposure to. Uh, one of my one of my former colleagues, uh, a, a gentleman, uh, James Garner, he's uh, he's currently doing his PhD at UMass Amherst. Um, he was actually a person we hired uh, five years ago um, as a seasonal to help us out. Um, but anyway, he's been, I actually did help him out on a study where basically he was using eDNA to calibrate um, uh to, uh, to calibrate towards some of our more traditional monitoring techniques. Um, so in the case uh, with river herring, you know, there was one year in 2021 where I was assisting him collecting uh, water samples. Um, and we were basically, you know, he was basically processing these in the lab. He was coming up with these uh, GCE scores, um, which he was then, uh, we were using it to compare to our estimates that were derived from our electronic herring counter. Um, and at the time he was actually finding a very high correlation between the two estimates. And so um, he's in the process of, of of writing up this study now, but um, it seems the, re the, the results seem to show, um, you know, seem to show some promise, at least um, to the point where, um, you know, I think in the future with, with more refinements to eDNA techniques, um, that you know, that I think it has. I think eDNA does have the potential to produce estimates that could, you know, that could closely complement that those estimates that you get from traditional sampling techniques. I mean, we did it for electronic counters with river herring. I also did it where he was doing eDNA, um, and he was comparing them to catch per unit effort scores that I was generating from an electrofishing survey that I conduct for American Shad. 
We all, um, and as well as fike net samples for rainbow smelt that we do that we that we also conduct. And so we've been finding some, you know, that some of these the results from eDNA seem to be quite promising. And I think there is potential utility to use those as uh, as uh, as a way of generating population uh, abundance. Great, thanks, uh, Bailey. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, John, for such a very interesting presentation. Really appreciate it. A lot of information there. Um, I'd like to make a few comments, which, if anybody knows me, is probably not a surprise. Um, if if Orland's doing a pretty good job with their counting, then in Penobscot, we must be like the gold plate standard. Um, I've noticed the Orland count, you know, sometimes they only count two minutes for a segment, a lot of missing days. And in uh, Penobscot at Pierce's Pond, we have uh, we break the day into four segments, four three-hour segments, and conduct thirty-minute counts during that time. So I think we're probably our our uh, error is pretty small in that respect. Um, the other comment I had was with run timing. It's it, it has become really variable here where I am, and I think probably due to, to climate change, but I can't prove that. But in 2015, the run started in, on May 3rd, and last year it started on April 19th. And we're seeing every year between 2015 and 23, the run has started two or three days earlier, maybe a week earlier than it might be two or three days later. But on average, the run is starting much, much earlier than in in uh, older you know days gone by and one year it was 2021 the run was completely over by may 16th and usually it runs into june so i'm just wondering you know i would think that would really screw up the um your run estimates if you're only counting between april 1st and june 1st or whatever your your time scenario is there and at that particular pond, um, we actually have a trap so that we try to count every fish. Um, that It isn't broken into segments of the day. We just stop in every couple of hours if there's a bunch of fish built up. We open a gate, count the fish as they go through. When the pool below the dam's empty, we shut the gate, go home, and come back a couple hours later. Um, it's just... Elwives are pretty resilient and they can jump over things and get under things. And uh, it's, we, we have a conservative count, even though we're, we are blocking 85, 90% of the passage, but it's just the, the timing of the run that I'd really like to comment about. Thank you. I think that what you're seeing there is, um, I think we are seeing a similar trend, especially in a lot of our Northern runs uh, north of Boston Harbor. Uh, so kind of like, uh, you know, Ipswich Bay going up towards Gulf of Maine. Um, one of the uh, studies, one of the phenology studies that I, I referenced in the uh, in the presentation there, you know, we did see that, uh, especially with some of the runs that we're monitoring in northern Massachusetts, where we're seeing a, a constriction of that window of, you know, when the when the run begins and when the run ends. It seems like a lot of our northern runs, the 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 migration period's getting smaller um, and, you know, attributing some of these to past studies where they're saying, you know, that the Gulf of Maine is, is, is warming up at a, at a faster rate um, and say some of our other, other locations there. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see that, you know, you're kind of seeing a, a similar thing there. Um, one thing that I talked about, um, you know, it, especially going back to limitations of the data um you know and the fact that it doesn't necessarily reflect that the estimates don't necessarily reflect uh changes in run timing you know and as i said before to folks you know they say you know when do i when should i go out and start counting and i always say well you know go when you know when fish are going to start showing up um one thing that can't one thing about these estimates is that um, especially over time, you know, you can go back, you can do a retrospective analysis, you can go back and re-estimate these, um, especially as new information comes in, it provided you have a, if you can, new, if you can keep um, your parameters standardized, 
um, you know, it is possible to do that. You know, so it's like the the, uh, the estimates are not necessarily ones that are set in stone. Um, you know, they can be, you know, they can be revisited. Yeah, and I, just going back to your presentation, I think that's that's why those zeros, you know, especially at the end and the beginning of, of a study where you're trying to monitor a, a run like this are are really important, you know, get out when there's no fish and leave when there's no more fish. Is That's mm -hmm. a good sign. Um, Ruth, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, so one, one issue we run into, so we have a, I coordinate the volunteer at Life Count at Nequasset Lake in Woolwich. Um, and one issue we end up running into near, you know, three weeks into the run is that the fish that came up at the beginning are starting to leave. And so our high counts with all the fish just going in, are, we're getting 10 minutes of counts of up to 200 plus. And so when you have those fish coming in and out, they'll go down one row of the ladder and then they'll go back up and they'll go down and up. And like the same fish will go through like 10 mm -hmm. times and volunteers are getting counts of like 600 or 700. <laughs> it's like, well, that's not right. And they're like counting as high as they can. Like they're just continual fish. Um, and so trying to figure out some of those really high counts, I feel like I I need to throw out. Some of the volunteers do a good job of estimating, like I think half of them doubled back. Um, but anyone have any recommendations for how to deal with those times that when there are just so many fish or you get the out migrating fish that kind of swim back up um, yeah. to, to balance out that error? Uh, so there's more, more than one person observing at a time? Or is it just one person who's trying to count and keep track of both inbound and outbound fish? It's often one person trying to keep track of both. I mean, some there have been, if there are couples there, sometimes they will assign like so-and-so counted up, so-and-so kept yes. track of down, but they're like, I mean, they're sliding back and forth and then swimming back up again. And so it, yeah. it's hard even with multiple people. Um, yeah, I one, guess one, one oh. thing you could do, Ruth, is, is uh, maybe experiment with it with like a v-wear at the end of the uh of the fishway exit at um at Nequasset. so the fish that are going upstream have a narrower slot to fit through so it it allows the fish to go upstream but it really starts to limit the numbers of fish that can find that narrow slot in the downstream passage and then once you get outside of your 10 minute or 15 minute um, counting period just take that that uh that device away and let those fish go downstream until you're until your next counting period. That'd be one way that they, they deal with it. And I guess another note uh, on Bailey's comments is that certainly um, if we have total counts, that the, the visual count program isn't a substitute for places where we get total counts. Those are really the gold standard. And we have a handful of places that do that. It takes a lot of time and effort, but boy, those are the those are the best counts that we have. And then we'd certainly encourage people to keep doing those if they can. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I, Totally hear you, Ruth. We deal with that too. You know, and a lot of times the fish leaving the pond will either muddy up the water or scare the fish that are coming up. Um, and so the nice thing is they usually leave in just really big pulses. At least it's you know from my experiences they'll they'll kind of wait, and then as soon as one makes the you know the leap, a lot of them will just shoot out of there. So it is a case where a lot of times you can hang out and just do nothing for 15 minutes, maybe while a pulse of fish is leaving. And then uh, you know just adjust your count, but it's um, it's a tricky one for sure. And I think the other piece is just that's where that comment section in your counts um, is, and you know folks can fill that in. I don't know, John, are there any um, are there any places within Visual Count where you can say my clicker says you know 800 fish, but according to you know the comments, like maybe we shouldn't believe it, or you know any ways to adjust. Um, confidence, I guess, in in certain counts, or you know, so and so said they counted this, and I don't know, we don't trust them. I don't know what it is, but are there are there different ways you can you can tweak that if a if a counting group says there's this issue or or things like that? You know, it's yeah, that's it's always that's always kind of a a, a tricky situation. Um, you know, if I think oftentimes, you know, if passage activity is low. Um, and you can keep, uh, you know, a good track of, say, you know, fish that are out. I mean, for the most part, I always tell volunteers, you know, just concentrate on fish that are going up. Um, 
you know, it's just once if it gets to a point where you if you, you see fish that are vacillating, you know, they're going back and forth, or especially if you're seeing a high volume of fish that are kind of moving up and down, you know, I I I tend to censor those counts because there's just no way you can, you know, really accurately uh, tell what's what's going on. I mean, oftentimes, you know, just kind of as a, uh, a matter of practice, like especially with like our electronic counters. Like once fish are, are migrating back down, because um, oftentimes, you know, they come down the same way they go up, you know, we have to remove the counters, you know, we just, because they just, it confounds the counts, it could, you know, it can wind up obstructing passage, fish wind up getting impinged on the screens and getting killed. So, you know, so oftentimes we have to, you know, we censor that data. Yeah, that's great. And good point that, you know, counting and the gold standard and giving great numbers is, is, what we're going for, but if it's at the expense of fish health, make sure that's the the bigger priority. Thanks for that, uh, Billy. You got a question? Yeah, uh, yeah. Specific um, comment back to Bailey about the the amazing difference in start times for for runs. Being we're on Mount Desert Island um, in Solmesville, the middle of the island, had a Solm Sound, and uh, we lag uh, the mainland sites so much like it bailey you said last year you started in mid-april maybe and then we ours last year was was may 8th and it might be due to um longer time for water to warm up on the island here versus the mainland but uh we we lag by sometimes two or more weeks from from mainland sites maybe might be similar for daryl uh, another uh general question about um if atlantic states put some sort of coefficient on uh, for total run calculations of what happens at night, like when you, when you can't see um, for estimating populations, because we know, I mean, they, they do come up. If we go first thing in the morning and we have a system where it's a total count and we can see who's come up overnight. If we're there first thing in the morning, we count multiple times per day, but it's, a, it's counting every, every single one. Um, if when they're, trying to to calculate population levels do they add x amount for nighttime movement based on whether it's uh counter data or or video somewhere is there some coefficient added does anyone know that yeah we don't we don't billy um what we do um places where we have electronic counters we don't have to worry about that because that does capture nighttime um migration so if there's a place where we suspect nighttime run, and, and, and certainly there's there are some places that that some runs in Maine that run at night fairly exclusively, they tend to be smaller runs, but but not necessarily all of them. Um, we don't make any sort of um, adjustments to the data for nighttime runs. What we do, uh, as John alluded to in his presentation, we use those daytime counts as a, a, a an index of abundance, not necessarily mm -hmm. a total run count, but index of abundance, with the assumption yeah. that if the daytime run increases, it, the nighttime run would increase in proportion to that yeah. for the most it's part. A, a relative and, change. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, 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 and use that so that um, we use the time when we actually have the counts as a as the as a standard for determining whether the, the population is increasing or decreasing. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I, I have kind of a question around that too. Um, uh, John, when you're, because they, you know, I think most runs do kind of follow the the seven to seven sort of window. Um, or in this question for you and Mike, is there, is that kind of one of the maybe things people start with when they're thinking about counting is going out and maybe, you know, getting out there earlier than seven, later than seven and finding out if, Seven to seven is the right window, or maybe if in your you know position you're you know I don't know what your conditions are, but if your fish aren't starting till eleven and they kind of tend to go late, or if it's an all night run, or if you have some proportion, is that good practice for for getting started if maybe you haven't counted a specific run before? Well, um, I would say that I think you know. If let's say you're uh, you want to count at a place for the first time, you know, no one, you know, people haven't counted there before. 
you know, in some ways it's almost like, uh, it's kind of similar to almost like operating an, an electronic or a video counting system. What I find is that with those, sometimes it can take a few seasons um, to really kind of like understand, um, you know, let, let's say like an electronic counter example, or you want to run a counter. I, I find that it can take at least a few seasons to really kind of understand, you know, um, and, you know, optimize the performance of that counter. When you think about things like, you know, you need to have a certain water velocity, the counter needs to be set at a certain depth, um, you know, and then you have to adjust your sensitivity to the counter and things like that, you know, to it basically what it is, it could take a few seasons to really like learn how the counter operates and how to get it to perform, you know, um, optimally. It's, I think it's kind of similar to a run where, you know, you, you may have to take, you know, a few seasons or so to really kind of go out there and really kind of understand, okay, you know, what is the nature of this run? You know, how many fish are really there? Kind of get an understanding of, you know, their behavior, their migration patterns. Is it, is it a run that occurs, you know, um, you know, primarily during the day or is it, you know, one of these ones where, you know, they only run during, you know, the magic hours, say dawn, dusk, or is it a nighttime run? You know, that may, you know, it may take, I guess what I'm saying is that it may take a, a a couple years of trial and error to really kind of figure those things out first. And so I think once you've kind of established that, um, then you want to make sure you want to try to follow a consistent pattern Um you know, in subsequent years. So it might take a, it might take a little time to kind of figure out, you know, your criteria, you know, your, your metrics. And then once you do that, you know, the trick is trying to follow it consistently over time. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think that's kind of a good point just to, to use in communicating to volunteers and just kind of as a longer term, you know, strategy is none of these are useful in just like one or two year stretches. This if a group is going to try to to do something like this, it's important to be upfront on like the goal of this is is for a sustainable long term you know data set that really keeps tabs on this. I mean, it's not just a one off because there is you know such a thing as getting burned out on counting fish and whether it's you know in a short window or over a, almost a decade. I mean, I, I think it's something real and something folks should folks should think about as they build their volunteer crew or their their group and and just how they talk about it so that's a good a great point mike do you have anything to add to that no other than that even even with things like electronic counters there are a lot of issues and one of the ones that folks might be familiar with here at peminaquan where we had electronic counters they did really really well while the populations were fairly low but as those populations increased and continued to grow what happened is about Oh, two thirds of the way through the season, we had so many downstream migrants that we had to take the counter out. So, even though you might have had good counts for, for the, you know, for two thirds of the season, you didn't have much for counts um, for the later part of the season because there were just too many downstream migrants that had to get through there. And unfortunately, for a place like the Pemmican, that's when you're starting to see a lot of bluebacks come up, and you know, so it's it's. Uh, it, it, it's not, you know, one method fits all. There, there are certainly issues with all of them, and it's just trying to find that sweet spot for the for the location that you have and the, the volunteers that you have to make it something that you can can uh, pursue in the long term to try to do the best you can to to follow and, and and monitor the runs and see how they're doing. Yeah, and folks don't know these electronic counters we're talking about now aren't video cameras. They're basically little kind of stacks of PVC pipe that where a fish swimming up the, the river has got to go through one of them. <laughs> and so and that's where they're counted. And that's why it can be problematic when you have, you know, a thousand trying to go through, you know, 20 tubes all at one time or, or some other issues. Um, and if you don't know what they are, you probably won't see one because I don't think uh, the company that made them is making them anymore. Um, um, but maybe there's, there's other things out there. So. Any other questions? Uh, um, Go ahead, Barb. Yeah. yeah, it's always been sort of, you know, our elephant in the room as far as our counts. I mean, we've gotten, one year we got 21,000. The next year we got 3,000. I've always wondered, is it is it errors in the counting? Is it just a natural variation in the run? Because um, we do have some some stream impediments, 
naturally natural impediments that the fish can only go through at certain flow levels. Um, and you, just that way our counts, because we showed them to Bailey at one of the meetings, and they're just all over the place. I mean, when you sit down and you look at the numbers, it, it doesn't seem possible. Um, and just wondering if, if sure. other counts have that big of a variance. We, we do sometimes on, on Mount Desert Island with the run to Sones Pond and, and Long Pond, uh, we think probably tied into what's what's gone on three and four years before in terms of some of the drought conditions and the difficulty of young of the year fish getting back out. And so they're not that many available to come back for the first time as either three or three or four year olds. And we've we've gone from like in 2018, we had about 38,000. The next year we had just over 7,600. And then the following year we were up to over 30,000 again. And, and then we saw that kind of blip down in the wave. Um, last year, we only had um, 12,660. Mm -hmm. So that's probably because that three and four years ago, we had low survival and, you know, outbound fish to come back. So it's kind of like putting a pulse in a, just in the, in the wave and in the, in the rope. And we're seeing that kind of go through, work through the population as the demographics proceed from year to year. Um, so we'll probably always have, at least in these small runs, some big, big variations. Yeah, you're right, Bill. And and especially smaller runs, they tend to be um, pretty flashy. So it's it's not uncommon yeah. to have them go from, say, 10,000 to 40,000 back down to 5,000. In one way, we try to mitigate that. One way we try to, to determine whether it's a count issue or a biological issue, whether it's survival or spawning success or mortality at sea is by looking at the, the year class data. So yeah. I, I know from M, from um, from Somesville, um, we had a period just not that long ago where most of the fish were just four years old. There weren't any, you know, five, six, yeah. seven year old fish. That's so right. it's a it's a you know it's a good way to 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 sort of verify or corroborate the the fact that you didn't have as much of a population available to return. Now we would expect and hope to see that good survival of those four-year-olds into five-year-olds the, the next year and then another nice year class returning as four-year-olds to increase the count right. but that's not always the case so that's that's one way we can help uh, uh monitor whether or not run counts are a result yeah. of of uh, maybe missed counts or if it's a more of a biological issue and we're kind of um, expecting with last year's heavy rains and, and good flow that we had good young of the year outbound migration. And hopefully, you know, we didn't have that many, but maybe most of the ones that that did hatch out and grew up and we were able to get some samples on of the young of the year on the way out four times last summer through fall um, that that there'll be whoever got out. Maybe they'll be more likely to make it to come back, um, even though it's low adult numbers coming in because we had a good good flow throughout the, the whole run time. Yeah, that's a great point as far as um, folks maybe getting started at this. I would think that, you know, a pretty solid pattern in folks counting fish, it takes them about three or four years to realize after they count the adults that the juveniles are just as important. Um, and so um, we can't cover all that today, but we've got other materials on that. So that's a really important point. Daryl, did you have a question? Or you could even probably yeah. comment on the Surrey yeah. run too. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, I wonder. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. I wanted to know where you count. Oh, and where sorry, do you count your fish? We count them yeah. at North End Road, right underneath the bridge. You know, where, the right. pond, where, the, where the where the boat launches. Yeah. The pond pond. I know. I know exactly what you mean. And but I used to count them underneath the bridge. Yeah. When, they go I, too when fast I used to count now. over there. Over right. The so so even even if you stand on the back side. Even if you were to stand on the backside? Do you know we haven't tried? Because we have to now get our scale samples. We have to go to the falls to get them. Right. We, have to get so them at you, the pool. we have to go all the way to the falls. So you're getting an accurate count up there underneath the bridge. Up yeah, we get to get in the so. pond. Yeah, so those fish are, they're there. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. They, they've made it to so the pond. No good. I just wanted to explain, you know, I got two brooks I do. Uh, one of them, is at the high tide mark and they in a pool and and I have to count them 
when they come in going up through. But my other pond, I count at the pond itself going in. Yeah. Uh, it's two different ways of counting. Uh, a lot of times, like a grist mill, it'd be early morning. Uh, and then just before dark, they have this big push if the tide's mm -hmm. right. But Don mm -hmm. Pond, always right before dark, uh, that's the biggest oh. push. A couple, oh. two, three hours before dark. That's when they have a drive. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to say about night. They do run at night. They slow down uh, dramatically, but they still funnel their way in. But I just mm -hmm. use them fish as extra. Hopefully, you know, added to my my count stuff or mm -hmm. whatever. We just call it good, you know. Yeah. All I have to say. Yeah. Is. All right. So on that note, Tim, it's amazing. You know, before the pool and where it was built, and you know, we were still netting. And I do believe we were underestimating because we were saying we had ten fish in a net, and I was usually releasing them, and I know there was a lot more than ten, but we said we'll right. go with. That. Um, we only did it two years before the pool and where it was built, but one year we got 15,000 and one year we got 25,000. And we have never, okay. the closest we've ever come to that is 21,000 now that the pool and where it's built. So right. either, either the, the count was skewed because the fish were making it up to the falls, but not through because of, uh, you know, you know fall conditions. Um, you know, right. I always wondered about that. Our 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 best counts were when we were doing what you did. You know, right. And, and so, so upstream from there, there's like a ladder, a, a natural ladder that they go up through. Have you ever yeah. been there? Yeah, the falls. Yeah, we, we call it the falls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried counting there? It's um, the th real reason probably we the reason we count where we count is because DMR. Well, that needs. Yeah, this is the spot. Yeah. So that was how we actually, right. you know, um, the the yeah. nice thing about where we do it is it's easy access for volunteers. Right. 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 So sure. it, it, to go to the falls, you know, you got to walk in, you know. Sure. Sure. You know, sure. You know, um, and so, and a lot of our volunteers are on in their years to put it mild. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so how's the how's how's we the beaver? Had, there? We had yeah. we had one guy with only one leg. <laughs> <laughs> How is the beaver dam doing over there? Oh, for so, <laughs> knock on wood. We only have 11. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Hey, I'll be going by there once in a while. I'll stop and see if I can't count them underneath the bridge. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're uh, yeah. I'm backside just to see what it looks like for you. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, that's great. And I think, you know, that just comes down onto the, you know, Daryl's got a lot of experience there. And that's another thing when you're getting started, kind of like what John was saying, is it you know, taking a couple years sometimes to, to nail these down? I think scoping out your counting spot and making it work for you is is a really important thing there. Um, John or Mike, do you have anything, anything to add on this? I don't have anything to add. Um. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, uh, in terms of like the actual visual count program, um, the one thing that's really nice is that the the uh, the most recent version of it now is 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 a lot more user friendly than it used to be because you know the some of the uh, screenshots that I showed you that was actually from the older version. Um, back then, uh, um, you know, people would have to send me count their count data, and you and in the past, I used to have to answer it manually so like line by line i'd have to answer each and every individual count which you know it would pretty much take up you know pretty much the majority of my summer and go into my fall because i'd be getting like 20 or so or you know so runs and having to enter in you know a couple hundred you know fields of data uh but the nice thing now is that you can actually uh with this new version you can actually um you know Provided you format the data correctly, and of course the uh, the visual count, um, you know, there's manuals and stuff like that. They tell you how to format the data, so you can do it in Excel, and then you can actually import it into the program. And the nice thing that's nice about that is that the program then corrects for any errors that could be. So it won't allow you to run the analysis until all the errors have been corrected. Um, so that's so now um, you know it saves a massive amount of time. Um, with this new version. 
Yeah, I'm excited about it too. Bailey, you got something to add? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, real quick, a question for John. Uh, we heard from Kevin Job down in Connecticut, I think a week or 10 days ago, that the fish were running down there. Just wondering if you've seen anything in Massachusetts yet. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have gotten some reports of, of, of a few fish showing up in, in a handful of locations. Um, as of right now, the only run that's really uh, going right now is the Namaskat River, uh, Middleborough. It's it's actually one of our southernmost runs because it's it's part of the Taunton River watershed. It ultimately drains into Mount Hope and Narragansett Bay and into Rhode Island Sound. So it's it's one of our southernmost runs, and that's that one historically always starts early. You know, usually around uh, beginning of March is usually when fish start showing up uh, there. So. Right now, things are still a little bit on the slow side. Um, so, but, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, they're coming. <laughs> so, I mean, each day I, I, I'm i getting reports of, you know, hey, I saw fish here and there and, and whatnot. So, for the most part, everything's still slow. It's I think it's just the first, you know, the early scouts are showing up. Um, yeah, again, you know, Middleborough is the only place where they're, where they're really running right now. Any other questions? We got about five or seven or so minutes left here. No, one one thing that we do for uh, for data recording is have a shared Google sheet, and volunteers will go for their time slot. They can sign up on that sheet for different um, times of the day, and then they'll enter their their count data, water temperature. Also, for kind of backup, have them text me their their numbers that they saw, which they might be there for half an hour or forty five minutes or sometimes longer until the fish at the top of the the um, the fish ladder at the mill pond in Sonsville have the tanks mostly gone through. They're all they're all done, but that's that's worked well. We we started that when with COVID, so we had less time handling the same data sheets and other things, and had a um, combination lock to keep the gate closed until someone would go, but that that's worked well for um, our data recording yeah. and places for notes and other things on it too. Yeah, I'll and second I, the the importance or or the niceness of having the text chain as far as you know, just filling in for for missed counts or if someone's yeah. seeing something interesting that they want everybody else to to keep an eye on or whether it has to do with something there's you'll never be able to predict what it's useful for but it's useful for a lot so i'll i'll second that one in surrey we also use google sheets and it really it has made my life so much easier because before we used to have a dropbox where they would have to you know everybody would fill out a form and then i'd have to fill everything in on the google sheets yeah. And same thing, we we count just like Bailey does, you know, we do it four times a day, we do it 30 minutes at a time, and it's been working out great for us. I mean, luckily, we've had enough volunteers, and with the Google Sheets, it's really nice. I could look and say, okay, well, nobody's there right now, and nobody signed up, and we're close enough, so then I'll just go and yeah. take the count, or Pat will take the count. Yeah, you mean for Google Sheets, scheduling and counting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for both. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just keep anyone... downloading the sheet because I'm always afraid that somebody's going to somehow be able to erase it, even though I only give permissions to X amount of people. Yeah, but it's, no. I just on a daily basis, I just keep on downloading to a folder so yeah. I don't lose it. <laughs> yeah, never underestimate people's ability to mess up a Google sheet. That's for yeah. sure. um, and, and if there are folks out there that um, don't have something like that and would like to, you know, there's several folks that have uh, different templates for these that would be easily, you know, sent to and use other places. So if, if so, we've been using a, a Google form um, and then it gets transferred into a Google sheet. And the nice thing about that is that you don't have to worry about people messing up the form. And you can also be a little bit more prescriptive about the things that they enter into each of the sections. And so like each of the sections in your Google sheet end up translating into a column in that Google form and oh it's been it's been really great it's worked out really well and it seems to be simple enough that um most people are comfortable using it i still have a couple who like call me and one or two that email me with their accounts but most people seem to be able to use it pretty well yeah um 
Great. No, thank you. Um, any other questions? We only have a, probably time for one more if anybody else has got one. I don't see any. All right, we nailed it on time uh, then. Um, special, yeah, special thanks to Mike and John um, for, for coming and answering questions and John for presenting. Um, that's really helpful. Again, we'll have this um, this talk and, and that slideshow and, and some of the other links to VisualCon and maybe even as I'm kind of writing notes, maybe some of those templates for some of the, the Google Sheets and forms and, and things like that for people to think about. Um, so with that, and feel free to, to fire emails off, you know, as we get closer to the fish run and closer to April 9th, which is our next River Herring Network full meeting. So if you don't have that on your calendar, um, you'll see more emails coming pretty soon. Um, it's April 9th, 1 to 3.30, I believe. Um, so thanks again, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you all soon. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Thanks. Right. Thanks. 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 Thanks.